Um, we've done this iterations of this panel before with Monique and Sonia, pa uh, Pablo and I, um, but I'd like to you know, type, share with you for, for the rest, share like some general bearings of where we are, and then to kind of like share with you guys where the idea for the panel comes from. And then we can begin with, uh, with the presentation. Um, so yeah, thanks for coming. Super, especially so early in the morning. I'm Carlo. I am the co-convener of this panel, along with Pablo Herrera. Um, I'm based in Estonia, Tallinn University, and Pablo is based in St. Andrews in Scotland. So this panel is a continuation of an ongoing discussion that we've been having on understanding the use of sound and music as ethnographic methodologies, as a means to present knowledge. The broad idea for this panel arose out of a concern about the relationship between sound and power. What are the conditions under which a sonic piece is recognized as an object of power? When, when does it have social force? How is sound a political act? On the panel abstract, uh, uh, we wrote, well, in one draft, I can't recall exactly which was the draft that went out, but we, you know, Pablo and I, we studied, we, uh, Pablo and I, uh, Sonia and Monique, we come from the Afro-Caribbean perspective, and we wrote something to, uh, like, we suggest that Caribbean and Caribbean descended music presents itself in complete ethnographic form as a challenge to written ethnographic production in and from the Caribbean. And we drew references from many Caribbean authors like Edward Lisson, Antonio Benito Rojo, Rex, Nef Rex Nettleford, and other authors who argue for body movement, rhythm, and music as central components of the Caribbean experience. So we're interested in approaches that look at music, not just Caribbean music, but now we are, well, music in general, as a generative and illustrative of ideological discourse. In other words, that we're interested in examining the ways in which music symbolizes ideology, yes, but it also encourages political action and music is constitutive of power relations. So in a region dominated by raciological discourses and the continuation of imperialist policies, grassroots expression of popular music carry an inherent transgressive potential. So in this panel, we explore the transgressive qualities of contemporary music or sonic cultures. How is, how is the music of the abject subject? How does it circulate? How does citizenry sound like? How can it not be transgressive? So this is a two panel uh, show. This is the, our, the first panel and uh, we'll begin with Sonia Stanley Mia. Uh, she's the director of the Institute of Caribbean Studies at the University of West Indies at Mona campus. She's a leading author, teacher, and researcher on Black Atlantic performance, geographies, popular music, culture, and the sacred. She has authored uh, multiple books and dozens of articles on Jamaican popular music culture. Then we'll listen to Dr. Monique Charles. Dr. Charles is a cultural sociologist. She's associated with the University of West, West London. Her research has focused on developing methodological resources to articulate the intersections between music, embodiment, spirituality, popular culture, class, gender, and race, from a perspective of the African diaspora. The next presentation is from Jadel McPherson. McPherson is an artist scholar whose research focuses on the intersections of sound and healing, mutual aid and performance in Florida, Haiti, and Cuba. McPherson is currently a PhD candidate at, at CUNY, Graduate uh, Center Anthropology Department, and is a teaching fellow with the Mellon Seminar for Collaborative Research and Engagement. We then continue with Pablo Herrera, my co-convener. Uh, Pablo is a PhD candidate in social anthropology at the University of St. Andrews. And the last presentation of the session will be Professor Michael Berimbao Quintero. Professor Berimbao is Associate Professor of Music and Chair at the Musicology and Ethnomusicology at Boston University. Um, his book, Rights, Rights, and Rhythms, A Genealogy of Musical Meaning in Colombia's Black Pacific, is forthcoming from Oxford University Press. It examines feedback, interference, and overlap between different experiences of Kurulao music. Um, the discussant for this session is Professor Jim Sykes, Associate Professor of Music at the University of Pennsylvania. 
He's a co-editor of the book, Remapping Sound Studies, coming up from Duke University Press in 2019, which imagines the field of sound studies from the perspective of the Global South. So, um, so we will present the papers in a row. Um, we'll request that if any of you have any questions or comments on the papers, you reserve them for the general Q&A at the, at, at the end. Okay, so without further ado, let's begin with uh, Sonia. Please, Sonia, take it away. Thank you so much, Carlo. Is everyone hearing me well? Uh, and can you see my screen? Fantastic. So my paper entitled Africa on Stage, Transgressive Sonicity and Identity in the Expressive Culture of the Black Atlantic is part of a larger project um, that I am um, examining in terms of Black Atlantic entertainment, suppression, and reparatory justice. And in, 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 in this context, I'm, I'm concerned about the aesthetics of noise that has characterized sound across the uh, Black Atlantic. I privilege sound in a deliberate Afrofuturistic sense, displacing the pejorative noise to claim the drum as it were, its sound as science, method, movement, pleasure, fantasy, and transgression in moments of silence and its high tones. Um, the work in, it, in its broader context, I am trying to do some things in this paper, define diaspora, examine the sound system, redefine noise, um, in a context of reinstating sound, examining sound and the politics of citizenship, sounding and grounding, those are some of the, the headings in, in the context of this larger paper. Clearly, I won't be able to um, go through all of them. But I use a sound system um, in theorizing sound and citizenship and its antecedents within an African sound diaspora context as a case to make statements about suppression, transgression, and citizenship. Um, in this sense, sounding is articulated as a practice, a form of productive labor, complementary to the labor of citizenship, of nation building, and celebration of the human. And, and, and I, I, I want to just be able to, to point out that Africa lives in its diaspora through melanated peoples, their sounds, and uh, performance practices. Uh, and, and we could ask questions, what stories do African diaspora sounds tell about citizenship, um, the politics of belonging, suppression, and identity? Most importantly, um, to contextualize from a historical point of view, the instruments of nation, their creators and enforcers following from an era of colonization and a post-coloniality mired in psychologies of smartification, that act of becoming somebody, and rejection have never been favorable in their intentions toward the way the masses have lived and had their being. So in this paper, I extend the work of scholars such as Julian Henriquez, Paul Gilroy, and also Jacques Rancière, who understood the aesthetic regime as an arena in which politics, pedagogy, and aesthetics are intertwined terrains. The politics of art is to break the consensus in the construction of sensitive landscapes and ways of perceiving a new kind of place. Even as I stay aware of reminders that the raison d'etre of black life is not resistance to white power, this paper is reparatory in its orientation. This political project is one of reclaiming the drum, as I said earlier. So this presentation centers musical diasporas, sonicity, and citizenship. And I want to just enter the dance hall with um, one of the, 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 the invocations from artist Anthony B, who, who in, his, in his lyrics tells us of the way in which reggae, music such as reggae, have had to struggle to become themselves. So, you know, many of us are appreciating reggae on an international landscape, but of course there were trials and tribulations, um, you know, um, acts of suppression, legislative instruments that went into the way in which reggae has in fact become a world music. But let me go back to the sound system as the voice of the people of Jamaica. In fact, the sound system as the instrument, the national instrument of Jamaica, which originated in the mid 1940s, but more popularized in the 1950s and 1960s, 
early sound systems were characterized by this, you know, tower of speaker boxes, amplifiers stacked atop each other with a turntable to reproduce and amplify music in a dance event, a dance hall event. The sound system is usually accompanied by a selector, so disc jockeys, box boys, sound men, engineers. And I want to most importantly um, introduce you, if you've never heard of Henley Jones, the man responsible as jack of all trades, um, who comes to national attention around 1940, who is directly responsible for the way in which sound has been amplified in the context of Jamaica. And many of these engineering techniques, of course, um, moving beyond Jamaica into other spaces through the apparatus of the sound system. The sound system I constitute as a politics from below. In the early days, sound systems were originally used to present music to the large lower class masses that could not afford radio and certainly definitely could not afford to even go to events where live bands were performing and certainly were not able to hire live bands for um, events. Instrumental in the creation and production of original Jamaican music genres, we're talking about ska, rock, steady, reggae, dance, all dub, and so on. The sound system is an innovation of the lower class, and we must um, you know, centralize that point that these innovations do not typically come from the upper classes. They come from the, the, the lower class, the lower middle class. Um, in amplifying the voices, their concerns, their issues and ideologies um, um, into a public sphere. Sound systems are largely identified with lower class performance practices. And we could talk about early sound systems, Tom the Great Sebastian, um, Duke Reed, Sir Cox and Dodd's Downbeat, King, Ed King, King Edward's Giant. Um, the um, Trojan sound system became the most popular. Um, and of course, by 1963, Sir Clement, um, Sir Cox and Dodd commissioned Jones, Headley Jones, to build the equipment for his Studio One recording studios in Kingston. Jones has been credited as Jamaica's most significant sound system um, electronics pioneer. But where are sound systems today? They are all over the globe. Um, beyond King Tubby's hometown Hi-Fi, a premier Jamaican sound system, or Clement um, Cox and Dodd's Jamaican sound system, the famous downbeat, um, or even Stone Love, Jamaica's um, premier dance hall sound system back in the 1980s into, into the current period, or even Firelinks. There are, in fact, sound systems all over the world, and some people count, um, certainly within the English-speaking um, world that I have been able to, to, to map, over 300 um, major sound systems operating. That is a conservative um, figure. So you talk about um, Muamba, Brazilian sound system in Sao, Sao Paulo, um, other sound systems, feminine hi-fi in, in, in Sao Paulo. India launched a sound system revolution, they call it, in 2016 through Base Foundation Roots, um, dubbing it India's reggae resistance, very much in um, contestation of some of the, the oppressive ideas coming out of um, Narendra Modi's uh, Hindu nationalist government. Base Foundation Root Sound System actually toured the entire country, trying to give voice to the oppressed through reggae music, Jamaica's eternal and unequivocal gift to the world. There are others, Lion Pulse Sound System in, in Bristol, King Shiloh Sound System in Amsterdam, Stepper's Record Sound System in Africa, many in Northern Africa, Tunisia, and so on. And of course, the sound system has manifested in events such as um, the, the Outlook Festival, a sound system festival in Croatia, happening annually. Um, and of course, I consider this to be the expression of the sound system in an outer national context. There have even been sound system clashes. Um, Red Bull has, through their Red Bull culture clash, uh, imprinted the sound system as an apparatus, as a, as a mode of performance in the context of an international sphere. They have had events in the UK, in South Africa, in Jamaica, and so on. But the politics of noise would have to be centralized in a context for understanding the history of suppression. 
So you can see from as early as 1688, prohibition on drums and horns. These are legislative instruments ac across the, the Black Atlantic. Um, in Jamaica, 1688, prohibition on drums and horns. By the time we get to 1760, irregular assemblies of slaves outlawed in Jamaica. Punishment of obia, so spiritual um, and sound practices very much interrelated are being suppressed. Um, you can see in 1711, law banning communication by horns and drums in St. Kitts. Of course, when we get to 1825, um, those slave acts then, by 1883 in Trinidad, ban on Kalinda bands, the Obia law in Jamaica in, in 1898. And of course, by the time we get to 1917, in Trinidad and Tobago, shelters prohibition ordinance, but most importantly, the Noise Abatement Act, which um, comes to us out of a colonial um, um, inheritance. In 1997, Jamaica instituted its own very, its very own Noise Abatement Act. But what do I what do I what do I want to 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 talk about in the context of all of this suppression is a way in which the very the very work of producing sound, you know, pejoratively called noise, creative work, um, is is the productive labor of a certain class of people, and that labor has value. That citizenship is in in the context of the the value of of work. Um, this value of sound and productive labor is, is, is very much caught up with the whole um, enterprise of citizenship. And of course, there are ways to quantify that productive labor, that value of sound. Tom Fleming's business plan approximated that 6,000 to 12,000 persons were employed in the music industry of Jamaica, some 2,500 being musicians and 1,700 employed by sound systems. So we are very much examining the fact that this productive labor, this, this value of sound has a place in the gross domestic product, contributing some 5.2% in the context of the creative industries. Um, the value of sound is therefore um, very much um, commensurate with the, 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 the work of citizenship in attempting to assess the economic impact of entertainment during the period 2012 to 2016, for example, using data from the Ministry of Culture, we were able to see that based on permits, issues and extensions granted, the value, a total impact of 71.4 billion over the period, with some 20,221 events on average being granted permits annually was reported. So, um, these transnational music cultures from 19th century singers to hip hop, reggae and rap in referencing ships um, as in slave ships, sound systems, phonographs, vinyl and other technologies um, that facilitate crossing very much feed into a longer historical trajectory of reading sound in the, in the, in the African diasporic um, context of articulations of identity. And so this paper, in its um, in its in its in its entire um, raison d'etre, is very much centralizing the sound system as one avenue through which to examine this longer trajectory of sound in a in a national well, first of all, in an inner city sort of local but national, post-national, transnational diasporic space and representation of identity. Um, and I argue that the sound system at the heart of this paper is a dream space, a freedom space, not bound by national boundaries, bound to the inner cities um, it, it calls home, but not bound by it. The sound system culture is tied to various musical genres, a specific volume, social movements, a certain space, profile, status, and much more. Um, and of course, the sound system tells stories of suppression. Um, a certain notoriety, in fact, characterizes the Jamaican sound. And arguably, Kingston is the loudest city in the Anglophone Caribbean, and Jamaica, um, the loudest country on the planet. I want to leave it there. Thank you very much. That's such it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Sonia. Cheers. Fantastic.
Okay, so we continue straight with uh, Monique Charles. Uh, Monique, you, uh, the floor is yours. You can unmute yourself and take it away. Maybe Sonia, you can unmute, uh, unshare your screen and then Monique can share hers. You know, I I have a different screen and I'm I'm trying to figure out how to okay. um is Maddie here, our how volunteer. To un um Mari, you there? Volunteer Mari? Yeah, I'm I'm okay. trying to fix it. Yes, thank you. Try it now, Monique. Uh Monique, you are on mute. Oh, there we go. I, I've got it. Yeah. Okay, I've unmuted myself now as well. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, I'll just click the slideshow button, but okay, right. Um, so yes, I enjoyed that, Sonia, so thank you very much. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about my methodological framework um, that I have called, or I have named Musicological Discourse Analysis, MDA for short, um, and how by using uh, this framework or this um, analytical method, you can come to locate what I have termed as a sonic footprint timestamp. So it's something that I propose um, applies to Afro-diasporic music in particular, but can be also used to help make sense of other genres of music as well. Um, okay, so... Um, I suppose I wanted to open with this, although I have anonymized the person. Um, this uh, this MDA um, comes from my PhD, my thesis, um, and it's been used um, by many people actually so far. Um, but when I was doing this, something really resonated with me and I had a, a participant, an MC, say that no one thought about embracing the architecture of the scene, where it comes from. You get me? How can it be 2013, obviously, when I interviewed him and you're, meaning me, doing it now when I was MCing in 1999? So, you know, he... Um, not necessarily was aware of the, uh, I suppose, politics with a capital P, as in politicians and things, but he was aware that there was definitely a movement with something that was happening. But anyway, just to kind of, uh, I'm not going to delve into the PhD too much, because um, that was a while ago now, but the MDA came as a result of my observations, so physical and online, so I went to events, I also immersed myself in online spaces, interviews with people like this particular MC, and analysing lots of uh, songs as well, particularly the ones that I was signposted to um, in terms of interviews um, and the ones that kind of drew the biggest responses online or in physical spaces. Okay, I don't know if I've shared my sound, so I don't know if you can actually hear that. Can you hear the music? Okay, cool. Right, I might have to press the stop button in a minute. So for those of you who don't know what Grime is, oh, I might turn the volume down. Just a little bit of a sample here for you to have a listen to. Let me turn it down a little bit if I can. See, this is what happens when you try to be flash. Okay. Let me see what I can do in terms of... Okay, right. This is, I think, three minutes, so I'm going to have to try and see if I can... This always happens. Sorry, guys. Enjoy enjoy the raving situation whilst I figure out what to do here. Uh, I might have to... All right, let me just quickly turn that off there then. Can you still hear that? Because I'm not sure if I shared my sound. Has it gone down? That's good. Um, can you hear me though, over it? I put it, put it, lower the volume of the phone no, a bit more, down. and then we'll be, it, we can be, know, turn keep it in the background. Forgive me, guys. It's okay, we're um, still on time. No. Okay, cool. Let me get back to my audio settings sorry about this we're still on right let me go to my audio settings for the moment and this is not how it was supposed to be guys um settings hey i like to do things off the head so these things can happen i guess all right so um or what i'll do actually which is probably going to be easier than fiddling around with all of this is to is to actually escape out of the Let me skip out of that. I'll just do it from. I'll do it this way because then I can control the the sound thing here. Okay, right. So 
Where was I? So anyway, that was just a bit of a sample for you to guys to actually have a listen to, but it was louder than I had actually <laughs> planned for it to be. You couldn't hear me talking um, whilst I was going to explain some of this stuff. We had some instrumental stuff there. So that's from some of the old grime stuff. And I should say, well, you're probably wondering if you don't know already, what is grime? More people are aware of it now. But it's a genre of music coming from the rough council estates of East London and is synonymous with black British youth. So a bit like what um, Professor Stanley Nye was saying, you know, rough council estates it kind of suggests something about class and also in the british context something about race it's a british form of music emerged in the early noughties of the 2000s and became as a known genre um with the mainstream hit in 2002 called oi by more fire crew so it's a male dominated genre um and it's characterized by fast beats as you could probably hear um and it had different names which i won't necessarily go into now but eventually it was called grime due to the heavy bass lines some of those of some of those you heard in that short snippet there um it's a diy genre as well um and it came to be because of the ease of access to techno technology so mobile phones nokia phones um playstations all that good stuff as well as people having access to studios and also people um having parents or grandparents connected to sound system culture which migrated over from jamaica to the british context Famous artists include people that you may have heard of, Dizzy Rascal, Skepta, Stormzy, Lethal Bizzle, Wiley, known as the Godfather of Grime. There are also some women as well, Lady Lejeune, um, uh, Lioness, Nole, for example. But anyway, when it comes to thinking about grime, a bit touching on some of the similar points that uh, Professor Stanley and I has already spoken about, the cultural formation of grime was a result of agency of the people in the scene, so the working class, which also included white working class and multi-ethnic working class people, as well as obviously the, uh, black people, which were largely uh, which are largely located in the working class position in the British context, as well as, uh, I suppose, the censorship, the censorship things that would come as a result of the police, uh, the councils or local governments and the media and uh, businesses not wanting to necessarily interact. So the cultural formation was a result of the tension between agency and also um, agency and censorship. So I won't necessarily go into too much about this, and this is pretty small, but what I did when I was trying to look at grime and contextualise it, I was looking at it as, as, yes, it's music, but it's definitely more than music. So it it's overarches into the political and le um, legal arena, if you think about censorship, musical as well, because it obviously has a musical history. One of the main things it's connected to is dancehall, reggae dancehall culture. Obviously, there's social aspects. Um, in terms of, you know, we are in Britain, there's a class element to this, a gendered element, and also a, a cultural element. We are actually in Britain, as well as having ancestral uh, um, heritage from various different parts across the African diaspora, as well as other um, members of ethnic groups being involved. So, um, how did grime form culturally? Well, the, the research uh, showed that when it came to grime and how it formed, it formed around um, the idea of... Um, or the values that were kind of central to grime are informality, being able to do it yourself, being able to kind of go off piste and do what it is that you want to do. And that is as a result of the agency, but also the censorship that was stopping um, you, you necessarily from accessing studios quite easily if you didn't already have familiar links, let's say. So you'd be able to... Uh, You'd be able to make things on your phone or make things on your PlayStation. Hard work as well. Honing your craft in your own time. Not something that on was on the curriculum. Popular music studies now is much more mainstream than it was in the early 2000s when young people w were actively involved in music. Competitiveness, the competitiveness or the clashing, uh, that kind of element of refining your skills, earning your stripes, definitely is also connected to um, dancehall culture as well, and even some of the hip hop ciphering elements. So these are some of the themes that came through. The spaces where grime ca came to be, I'll touch on those in a little while, but again, those were as a result of agency and censorship from the state. And when we think about, uh, I suppose, when we think about it more in a legal context, there was definitely things with regards to politicians overtly saying something about young, uh, black and working class youth. Uh, legislation 696 banning music from particular spaces and banning particular events and how it was written about and given a name from the outside um, in, in some instances as well. So um, I suppose I've kind of touched on this already. So we think about informality, self-teaching, um, um, you making use of personal networks and um, 
accessing alternative spaces, making use of the spaces you already have. For example, the home is very central when it comes to music making in, in the, the grime DIY space, youth centres possibly as well, maybe record shops. These are spaces, well, I suppose I'm going to talk about spaces in a minute, but these were spaces that were uh, have cultural value and places where information and uh, information and knowledge were exchanged. It wasn't in a formal capacity of a school, let's say. But also these spaces are quite gendered. So certain types of knowledge and training would be passed through these spaces as well. Because if you think about g in terms of gender, masculine or the male is considered to be more in the public domain and the feminine or girls are usually confined, if you want to use that word, uh, to the private space, to the, to, to the kind of home life. Um, uh, there was definitely an entrepreneurial element here as well. So, you know, you were not necessarily going to get support by businesses to kind of help people for, for people to kind of invest in their craft. You would have to do it your own, you know, maybe work somewhere and earn your own money so you could funnel it into what it is that you wanted to do. But definitely when it came to grime, if you think about it sonically, it was definitely experimentation and openness, putting all sorts of sounds together whilst also drawing on some of the ancestral uh, link. So again, if I'm going to make a direct connection, let's say to uh, reggae dancehall, the use of non-musical sounds, the use of reverb, the use of echo, you know, these some of these things may have found their way into grime music, but also door slamming, dogs barking, water dripping, non-musical sounds are also kind of used. And I'll kind of talk about some of the, the reason why some of those sounds were used in the British context as well. Um, so I've kind of outlined some of the values there already. Let's move on to the next slide. Um, okay, so spaces, I kind of touched on this already. Um, uh, uh, so grime circulated through the AG and S stages. AG and S is avant-garde and scene-based stages of a genre. A genre, well, mo many genres don't necessarily make it across or tele teleologically. They don't all grow to a final point of becoming a traditional genre. But uh, Professor Lena, um, Jennifer Lena, she talks about different stages that genres go through. So avant-garde is very, very early on when a couple of people know about it. Scene-based is when it's still kind of underground, but it's got its own vibe before it gets into the industry and it becomes commercialized. So if I'm talking about the very early stages in the noughties where this was becoming a thing, building its own momentum, building its own kind of social movement, spaces were at home, pirate radio again, because you know, if we think about business, if we think about uh, mainstream spaces, they, you know, they were not making space for this new sound. When the, what you heard earlier, when it first came out, it was completely alien in many respects. It was something that had never been heard before. And I'll talk about the significance of those sonics as well um, in, in a little while. So, yeah, community spaces. So in school playgrounds or in youth centres, record shops are touching as well. People being what we would say as on road. Um, or, you know, in the street, street culture, but on road is like a British term where people would just be on, on, on the road spraying bars, um, having their own clashes on, on the street. Eventually, there were some kind of uh, low budget TV shows or TV um, channels once satellite or cable TV became a thing. So, you know, people had a bit more money. They could funnel them and make their own low end uh, channels. Um, so people could use that, do make home videos on a VCR, yes, VCR way back then, and, and, you know, film and make their own music videos. Online was very significant because in many respects, although it was a middle class thing to begin with, it did actually enable people to create things more easily and upload things and share things much more easily. Raving and nightlife was obviously a space, but the censorship was really um, in terms of loudness or, or noise, as it would have been seen by the mainstream, but also... Um, yeah, so in terms of that, um, and in, also in terms of, you know, unde undesirable people kind of gathering in spaces and concerns around that and conflating certain groups of people with crime and all sorts of things going on there. Censorship was really quite tight when it comes to physical spaces, even though it was, there was some censorship in um, on online spaces as well. Print as well, magazines, newspapers, some more left-leaning, if you want to call them that, left-leaning papers may give one or two uh, bits of exposure to grime. It's a bit more common now, um, but especially in the early days with the with print, the ability to make your own kind of press, your own blog, your own magazine wasn't really a thing. Um, but, you know, they were slowly taking up space. 
Um, but these people that uh, the early people that had um, access to kind of tangible spaces, if they did have somebody, you know, a dad or a family member that was involved in sound system culture and could actually get their hands on vinyl, could actually get access to the studio. These were the ones that eventually were positioned as the cultural pioneers of the grime scene. Um, I suppose you could say movement now. Now we're kind of looking back on it a bit reflectively. Yeah. The virtual aspect of it, the online stuff was beneficial for fans. It enabled um, international exposure, especially as the Internet came up alongside grime, enabled a wider um, a wider set of people to access it whilst it was being clamped down on by the Metropolitan Police in the first instance. OK, I'll quickly uh, move on to the next one. So some of the politics. Um, OK, so the way that Grime develops, I've kind of I suppose, I've touched on this with this tension between censorship and agency. Um, you know, it's influenced by the music streams and institutions and practices um, of, I suppose, its um, parent genres. A reggae dancehall being one of them. Electronic music, you could hear definitely hear some of the electronic and experimental music influences there. Um, hip hop as well, because that was instrumental, you wouldn't have heard them spraying bars as 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 it's known. Um, uh, and obviously the spaces in which the values and the spaces in which this circulated obviously also contributed to this. The genre of music uh, and the mainstream was obviously pushing back with censorship, but one of the main the, one of the main things to point out is when it comes to grime, it was never, ever seen as a desirable music form. Um, and so it became a movement um, of its own and to the point where um, politicians in the mid noughties started to condemn it and say it's it's blaming it for knife crime. It's blaming it and um, basically saying it's a criminal culture. It's a music of a criminal culture. But if you think about young people coming together to make this music, make these sounds um, spray about their lived realities, which was, was a lot, which formed a significant portion of what the grime music was about at the time. Um, you know, it managed to get onto the radar of politicians. Um, so there was definitely a real buzz and a real movement happening. So um, I suppose I've kind of touched on some of these things. So we've got internal and external factors, the agency, the censorship. Um, with the Internet, we have rapid expansion of grime outside the UK. So we've got ca Canadian grime, Japanese, um, parts of Eastern Europe, uh, Netherlands, East Coast, um, USA and California, um, even Australia. There's lots of different spaces um, where it has um, kind of expanded to. There are some grime nights as well. Well, there were some grime nights, um, but they ended up having to be instrumental. And there's also something about the person speaking, wanting the sounds, but not the, the, the voice or the person connected to the voice that might be speaking, um, which was interesting. Um, and that's related to um, a Form 696 which was kind of really used to kind of clamp down on, on events. Um, and one of the things around the clamping down of events were particular genres of music were targeted more than others, which in turn targeted particular ethnic groups, largely black and brown um, people. But I'm not necessarily going to go too much into that now. Um, but anyway, so that's just kind of a bit of an overview. Um, and so what came out from... Uh, this particular uh, thing, and let me see if I can make this one bigger because it might be a bit easier to see. So so this is effectively after all of the uh, observations, listening to the songs, interviewing people, reading various different sources. Um, this is ultimately uh, what I argue music in general terms is. Um, well, initially it was for Grime and then I expanded it out to Black Atlantic music and then uh, beyond. So if we uh, if we engage with the, with those at the center of the scene that are making the music, engage with the music, um, see how people you know physically engage with the music, what they have to share about the music. We have to consider the the context. So if you remember, I had the, a, a, like a four Venn diagram of all the diff some of the different things to consider. We can begin to see music is never in isolation. It's so it, it's sound. It's uh, music is social as well as sound or sonic. And uh, it becomes music because people organize it according to their cultural um, or their their cultural sensibilities, their sonic sensibilities, what makes sense to them. And some of the things that make sonic sense to them are the things that they listen to growing up. Um, some of the things that come, you know, from their parents or grandparents, which may have um, who may have may or may not have migrated. Music migrates with people as well. Um, also, the soundscape. Um, where do you live? Um, are you somewhere that 
where there's lots of noise? Are you somewhere where there's um, slow sounds, fast sounds? Are you somewhere where there's lots of layered sounds? So we think about grime. Grime's got lots of layered sounds. We think about high-rise council estates, for example. There's lots of uh, lo-fi sounds, not necessarily in clear focus. Uh, something panning to, you know, to your this reverse. So I think this would be all right because I think I'm a mirror image on the screen. So, you know, something panning to your right, something happening nearby, something, you know, train going back past in a distance and also lots of distortion as well, because you've got lots of large flat surfaces where sound can be distorted. So this these sort of things start to find their way as well as the door slamming, the water dripping because England loves rain or Britain loves rain. But all of these sounds start to find their way in. And the fact that the song or the, the songs or the music that was being made um was so alien when it first came it, it was there to take space it was there to take space because it was completely unlike anything that people had heard before especially if you were not from the uh i suppose the the sonic uh spaces or the soundscapes where people were actually making the music in their home or in particular event or you know particular event sites if you were from the suburbs you would never have heard the soundscape of of the inner city in that way to even for it to even make sense to you musically or, or sonically. So you know, these are some of the things here. OK, so if we think about the music when it comes to grime, um, how does or, or how does one it, how does one express power? You, you assault the senses, if you want to call it, I don't know if assault the senses is the right word, but you come with something completely different that kind of reconfigures reality in many respects. It just reconfigures reality. And although when it first came, it wasn't necessarily anything overtly political, the, the ability to kind of reconfigure and re-alter reality and, you know, prioritise the sense of sound over and above everything else is an act of articulating your resistance because you're articulating music that makes sense to yourself and overriding the senses of anybody else that is in that space so you can hear the politics is about to come the lyrics haven't weren't necessarily there at the time but they were going to catch up okay so it's alternative communication um Perkinson, Goodman, Hebdige, they refer to this as an internal coded resilience, um, an expression of power. Henriques talks about it in that way, um, or a subversive or transform, um, transformative nature or ideology. McClure talks about it in that way. I say that SFT is a expression of existence. SFT, Sonic Footprint Time, so it's, it's evidence of existence, an expression of existence, especially if you're being clamped down from all of these different angles. Um, so the composition of organizing music through the use of bass, breaks, ruptures, flow, pastiche, um, they create new dimensions to transmit in a hidden intentionality. It mixes the past with the present. So we definitely we've got ancestral connections here um, to transcend the current circumstances which you find yourself in. Okay, If we think about the, the black British and working class black British youth at the time, they were vilified. It was, came, you know. In the early 2000s, you know, there were, you know, you're a chav, you're a ghetto. There were all these sorts of things kind of demonizing young people. It still actually happens in the British context. Um, you know, and through amplification, you know, this alien sound that hijacks the senses at, at volume, if you amplify that, it restructures social hierarchies and it rhythmizes architecture and people in a new, in a new way and in a new dimension. And it gives those people who are, um, demonstrating the evidence of existence through musically through actually creating it themselves or enjoying it or relating to it it gives them um the the position or uh, the moment to assert themselves assert themselves assert their group articulate their citizenship they can do it in a way that other traditional roots would not allow so if we think about grime grime is about 20 years old for argument's sake OK, so if we think about Professor Lena talking about how genres tra transition over time, we're definitely in the industry stage. We could even be in the traditional stage now because we have people saying this is what real grime is. So when you get to the traditional stage, people want to go back to the essentialist version of what it was when it first came out. So, um, you know, it's 20 years old. Those young people that were involved in the scene, they may have been some of them may have even been like maybe 13 or so. By now, you know, 20 years on, they are they're fully fledged adults. And some of some people that have grown up in it, they've always known grime to exist. They're not always they're not as, as old as me to not remember a time when grime didn't exist. But now we have adults that know grime as part of their existence. So this this foreign sound is now part of their sonic palette and makes sense to them in their everyday life, especially if they already live in in these in 
in the spaces where the soundscape kind of matches what is being made. Um, but, you know, even whilst this music was being made, you know, uh, people were living in uh, in hardships, you know, they were living in hardships, experiencing a working class existence. Um, so, you know, they'd be speaking about daily life and things like that to begin with. But as time moves on and as people get older, um, they may have seen their mom or their parent, you know, their mom, their cousin, somebody in their extended family, if it's not directly them, struggling. But as they get older, they can begin to enact or take political action with a capital P about things that they may feel passionate about. So if you think about 2010, um, some of the young people by this time would have been thinking about going to university. When the government raised tuition fees, there were protests. They were using some of the grime music to kind of articulate how they were feeling. Um, when there were the riots after Mark Duggan was shot, there was the use of, um, you know, use of the grime music to kind of push, push back against um you know, to articulate how they're feeling. But when we get to the point of the general election in 2017, for argument's sake, if they were, if somebody was born around the 2000 mark, they're now at the age where they actually can vote politically. They can do something that is political, that has low uh, personal cost to them in the sense that they're not going to be kettled or arrested or anything like that. And so people are now feeling much more comfortable to take over political action about things that they may have seen their family members suffer with or, or suffer as a result of maybe cuts to housing benefits, um, not being able to find work, all these sorts of things. They actually can take action about these things. And you also start to see some of these things featuring in some of the lyrics now as new waves of uh, grime artists uh, come through. So over the 20 years, um, there was an increasing self-awareness amongst the late mill millennials and early Zoomers about their political power. Through the new, and I say new in, in, in inverted commas because black British music has been around, uh, well, since the Windrush, um, even before, if you want to be technical. But since the Windrush, since people migrated to Britain in larger numbers since 1948, you know, there always has been a black British music scene, even though it's been underground. Um, um, so it's always been political with a small p, starting with the sound you know, hijacking the senses. But over time, as people have grown and, you know, people be, feel comfortable to articulate their lived realities, um, they feel that they're able to now challenge and tackle, uh, you know, the isms, the classisms, the racisms, the sexisms, all that, the, the, uh, critique the politicians themselves as well. Um, let's see what else. Um, OK, also, because because of the especially with the global recession, middle class people started to feel a bit of the pinch. The um, 2008 when the recession happened. So it was cool at the time. So you've got the middle class is feeling the squeeze. The youth, they're also kind of um, leaning in towards the uh, leaning in towards grime. Um, and in doing so, I suppose that kind of helped it to kind of mainstream a bit more because around the, the late noughties, it did mainstream. Um, and we find that. Um, it became a vehicle for working class people to talk about what their lived realities and middle class people to begin to kind of also kind of use it as a vehicle to kind of articulate their realities as well. Um, let me see if there's anything else here. OK, I'll just I'll start to wrap it up because I know that I I can keep going. Um, so, yeah. So if we think about um, newer black artists that come through, um, such as Dave, some down here, you know, they're talking about the political the, or um, they're talking about political decisions or what the things that the decisions that um, politicians are making, um, the impact that political decisions have had on their family. So Dave has got a song called Question Time, talking about his mum as an um, NHS nurse struggling, um, talking about the war in Syria and why is the British government involved. So they start to kind of ask questions about what is the government doing overseas? What is the government doing to our communities? Um, and many of many of the artists are still very much engaged or connected to the working class spaces that they originally came from, or even those that have come up, you know, as, as a new wave of grime emerges, have also come up from these spaces and are very much connected to these spaces as well. Um, and if uh, famous examples, for example, are Stormzy, um, who has, um, he critiqued Theresa May at the Brit Awards in 2019. And, um, you know, in Glastonbury as well, he, you know, he was uh, overtly supporting um, Jeremy Corbyn as well. So the the kind of, I suppose, the lyrical element of the ideolo I, over ideological element of the politics um, has arrived. But it definitely the sonics were letting you know that something new was about something new was coming, something new was coming. Um, 
And so, yeah, at the moment, we're at a stage where um, people are comfortable to kind of voice political concerns. Um, but strategic organizing is still in its inf- infancy. People haven't quite figured out how to convert online presence, uh, you know, into on the ground um, strategic organizations. There have been kind of um, F Boris parties and things like that, if you think about the last general election. Um, but beyond gathering to protest about a particular thing, there haven't been um, sustained or strategic organizations in an overtly political sense. So I think I'll leave it there. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Mr. Great. Lovely. Thank you very much, Monique. So we continue uh, with the program with uh, Jadel McPherson's paper on Eusebio Cosme. Uh, Jadel, the mic is yours. Hello, everyone. Hmm. Just so you know, we're okay for time still. So don't don't, reason, don't panic too much. We're, we're okay. okay. <laughs> for some reason, I was having trouble sharing the sound, but um, this should this should work. Hopefully, bear with me here. Okay. Let's see. There we go. So can you all see my slides? Okay, good. Yes. Thank you. With the tongue, I start with this idea. With the tongue, one can give ashe, one can consider things, one can proclaim virtue, praise works and means. And with a tongue, one can also elevate human beings. So I'm gonna open with a little invocation. Echoro lo dio monya la guana con mama que ya ira wo baba eke baba o bara o bara o bara suayo eke echo dara echoro lo dio monya la guana con mama que ya ira wo Baba eke, bara suayo, omonya la wana kuma makenya irawo, bara suayo, omonya la wana kuma makenya irawo. Baba o bara o bara suayo eke e shodara o monya la wana ko mama kenya irawo e baba go go ashure o. Ago, ago, ashureo. Bara la iki ago, baba. Ago, ashureo. Bara suayo, mama Kenya. Echo dara Kenya irawo. Bara suayo, mama Kenya. Echo dara Kenya irawo, bara suayo mama Kenya. Echo dara Kenya irawo, bara suayo mama mama Kenya. Echo dara Kenya irawo. Es Yoruba, 
My godmother, Naivi Angarika, one of the most knowledgeable and sought after ritual singers in Havana, chastised me. She wanted me to listen carefully to the pronunciation of the words as Yoruba musically hide sounds that we don't use in colloquial English nor Spanish. Naivi grew up hearing and singing these words in her family when she was born in Havana in Pugolori, a neighborhood in Marianao known as La Pequeña Africa, Little Africa, where she still lives. Bogolori is home to generations of Afro-Cuban musical virtuosos from Dimba, Song, Rumba, Yoruba, to Abaqua, as well as a historic field site for anthropological studies of Afro-Cuban religions. Naive's family branch of Haitian descent lives this legacy as their last name carries the weight of a renowned family at the forefront of Afro-Cuban religion and performance. Sound connects many of the intimate moments that Naive and I have shared over the years while moving to and from gigs, sharing meals, or sitting on the porch in front of her family home. My training as an Akpon or Orisha, or Orisha ritual singer comes alive in motion. As singing puts cosmology into action, Orisha songs must be sung in time with clave and the drum, the bata. Dia itotele en okonkolo, the mother, follower, and the child. The songs are oral histories that also invoke social memory through their references to the lives of the Orishas. Yoruba becomes woven into the daily fabrics of the quotidian as daily intervention on the difficulties of black social and political life. Given my training as one of few women Akbones working currently in New York City, I start here in Ritual to move towards social and political performance histories in part to demonstrate their connection and fluidity in Afro-Caribbean and their diaspora contexts. I argue that the histories of afro name mutual aid societies are connected through social actors who have been marginal in archival histories about the Cuban diaspora, and that women, both artists and spiritual practitioners, forged diasporic spaces that attended to the politics of their home and African diaspora communi communities. Therefore, I begin by positioning the ritual singer alongside these social actors who embody what literary scholar Antonio Lopez called, quote, Afro-Cuban American vocality. This idea of vocality is a fruitful lens to begin to ethnographically study and center Black Cuban women's creativity and sacred transnational mutual aid networks. These diasporic spiritual and cultural performances also articulated gendered and racial politics through performance. Performances also form social memory that everyday social actors use to play or to perform while the histories of social clubs and institution building in the Cuban diaspora have traditionally been masculine, artists such as Esubia Cosme Almanza, the late poet and actor from Santiago de Cuba, known for reciting Afro and Tillian poetry, offer an opportunity to examine the historical and contemporary politics of performance and conceptions of diaspora in the nation. In her book, Suspect Freedoms, historian Nancy Raquel Mirabal investigated the racial and sexual politics in the makings of the Club Cubano Interamericano, or the CCI, arguing that, quote, the diasporic workings of racial separations among Cuban migrants shaped early 20th century definitions of Cubanidad, end quote. Subsequently, the book's arguments show the ways that Afro-Cuban women and migrants created the club and how its inner politics resonated with African-American and Afro-Caribbean migrants also living in New York City. We can interpret the archival histories to see this in extensive interviews with club president Melba Varado, who just recently passed away in 2019, who was a close friend of Cosme's and was also born in the Oriente, the eastern region of Cuba. Alvarado emigrated from Mayari, Cuba, with her family in 1936 to New York City and presided over the CCI in 1957. Under her leadership, she recognized that artists were integral to the events and social life of Afro-Cuban migrants in the, in the club. However, the history of the CCI and broader 19th century political histories uh, in, in, the, in the histories of the CCI and broader 19th century political histories are peripheral. Although Cosme's body of work is portrayed in scholarship as part of the rich fabric of social or musical entertainment, her work made the solidarities that fuel the club possible. As an artist, Cosme's career in New York on stage and in radio reimagined the Cuban nation 
transnationally, as well as potential as well as its potential reach through an Afro-Antillian politics, articulated through poetry. Cosme shared heritage in the eastern region of the island with founding club members like Alvarado also reimagined or put into motion an Afro-Cuban and Antillian politics steeped in centuries of Haitian and West Indian presence in Santiago de Cuba and the eastern provinces. However, another reality also distinguishes Cosme from the founding members of the Club Cubano Interamericano. which included good friends of Cosme's who were intellectuals and professionals of color. Cosme was a black Cuban who traversed the racially segregated Cuban social spheres, including the, ra the racial separate clubs in the US. Her life's work and trajectory opened several questions. What are the afro latin performance histories of New York and Tampa? And how did Afro-Cuban women artists and migrants contribute to them? What role has sound and live performance played in the racial and gender politics of the Cuban diaspora? And how might they shift our current discourses about the Cuban exile communities in the United States? And lastly, after about 100 years of history, what do Afro-Cuban American mutual aid practices birthed in Key West, Tampa, and New York City look like today? Sylvia Cosme y Almanza was born into a black working class family in Santiago de Cuba between 1908 and 1911. Her parents, Herman Cosme y Leocaldi Almanza, earned their living working at the Marcane family estate, a white aristocratic family known for its patriarch, Luis Fernandez Marcane, who was a prominent legal scholar and writer in Cuba, who was also elected to the Cuban Senate during the early 1930s. Tragically, Herman and Leocaldia Cosme both died before fully raising their daughter and their loss must have been difficult for her and their families. A mixture of Catholic local devotions to the Virgin of Charity, Congolese and Espiritismo practices were common when Cosme's parents, um, Leocaldia Almanza and Herman Cosme grew up in the region. The Cosme family also has an understudied history in the town of El Cobre, right outside of Santiago de Cuba, where royal slaves used manumission, cuartación, to free their enslaved family members since the 16th century. Like many soldiers who fought in the Revolutionary Wars, Herman Cosme may have carried the image of the Virgin of Charity with him as he served in the Mambis, in the Mambi army in the Ten Years' War in 1895. If Sylvia Cosme may have also heard her father reference the cigar factory workers in Key West and Tampa before she moved to New York City in 1938, where she quickly rose as a member of the transnational Cuban community. The story of Afro-Cuban mutual aid clubs in the US begins in Ypres City, Tampa, parallel to Cosme's parents' lives. After the, after the Circulo Cubano in Ypres City was forced to segregate its initial multiracial membership due to racial segregation laws in the South, two sects of black cigar factory groups formed into La Sociedad La Unión Martí Maceo in 1908. These migrations to work in the cigar industry in Key West and Tampa afforded Afro-Cubans more economic stability than on the island, as well as a space to push for racial equality within the larger nationalist politics of the struggle for sovereign nation free of Spanish colonialism. Therefore, the founders named the club after the Cuban revolutionary heroes and orators Jose Martí and Antonio, Antonio Maceo. Martí's speeches in Tampa cigar factories were also political performances which encouraged Cubans to embrace the ideal of racial fraternity in order to challenge Spanish colonialism and the formation of a new sovereign nation. Paulina Pedroso was an activist who used her home in Ybor City to support the revolutionary efforts from 1892 to 1896. She and her husband, Ruperto Pedroso, housed Jose Martí in a boarding house after he was poisoned during one of his trips to Tampa. Martí had built relationships with many Cubans of color about three years prior to working with the Pedrosos, including Juan and Jerónimo Bonilla from Key West and Rafael and Gertrudis Serra from Matanzas, who arrived to New York in 1882. They all became very active in La Liga, a Cuban and Puerto Rican revolutionary club formed in New York in 1891. 
La Liga sponsored many weekly events where artists performed, and they would also frequently collaborate with African American and Puerto Rican artists. Afro-Cubans influenced Marti's theories of racial fraternity while they also participated in the revolutionary movements by using their collective salaries um, to fund the Mambi Army in, in Cuba. In more than black, Afro-Cubans in Tampa, anthropologist Susan Greenbaum studied Jim Crow's impact socially and politically on Cuban and Bahamian immigrants who made up a significant percentage of the cigar industry workforce during the economic boom of the late 19th century. Black immigrants worked in integrated spaces at their jobs, but they could not study, join the same social clubs, or attend church with their coworkers. In this community, immigrant couple, couples such as Ramon and Susan Valdez played a significant role in fostering sacred spaces. They co-founded the St. Episcopal Ch Church in, in, I think, 1892, the first Black church in Tampa, and were also part of the same working class immigrants and professionals, including doctors, teachers, artists, who were all part of the founding members of the Sociedad Martí Maceo. In his memoir, Black Cuban, Black American, Evelio Grillo personally remembers attending weekly seances or misa espirituales to help them resolve their issues. These convergences of the spiritual, of labor and mutual aid resonate with my own childhood upbringing with the descendants of these first black Cuban migrants coming from Tampa to the South Bronx. My family lived about four blocks away from the original CCI building. And my mother's madrina also lived there who was born into one of the oldest Afro-Cuban families in Key West in Tampa. During this period, espiritistas from Cuba and Puerto Rico actively supported their families with love, with spiritual care, all under the guise of utmost secrecy and eventually um, creating another layer of the social fabric of mutual aid practices in New York's Afro-Latine communities. Espiritismo then marked the sacred space and coded gestures and language that became definitive for Afro-Caribbean musical genres as well. Misa espirituales or spiritual masses were led also by women, many black women, who communicated directly with spirits that were classified according to their respective Caribbean colonial identities, or, or say, outside of the United States categorizations. Sound was crucial to the ways that spirits of the dead manifest in ritual space through summoning of songs led in call and response choruses. Spirits may shout, they may breathe heavy, they may hit their legs or make other percussive sounds to create an oral world that communicated the messages of the dead. This care was foundational for afro latine and West Indian immigrants and migrants in the Bronx. This generation used mutual aid in order to help one another to survive daily, working excruciating long hours and low paying jobs. Their love and their wisdom guides me ancestrally and epistemologically to critically engage with the archival sciences around the political and spiritual labor and performances of the Cuban diaspora. From its onset, the New York Cuban clubs held a unique juxtaposition to its sister communities in Florida as they emerged within a larger landscape of Afro-Caribbean activism, independence movements, and cigar worker organizing, where the bibliographer and scholar, Afro-Puerto Rican scholar, Arturo Schomburg began his work that also bridged Spanish speakers of African descent with African-Americans and West Indian intelligentsia in Harlem. All of these activities planted the seed for the emergence of the Club Cubano Interamericano. On September 7th, 1945, the feast day of Yemaya or La Virgen de Regla, a small group of about 100 people formed the Club Cubano Interamericano in New York City. In this group, there were founders such as Marco Sierena, a cigar worker who had relocated to New York with his family, who had previously participated in social clubs in Havana, and was a founding member of La Sociedad Unión, in Tampa as well, before becoming a founding member of the CCI. Thus, these transnational connections between Black Cuban social clubs through membership and families connected geographies that we tend to treat separately in scholarship about Cuba and the Caribbean.
As such, the initial activities and performances focus largely on Martí and Maceo, as well as the histories of people of color on the island, echoing their predecessors. There were constant migrations of people, families, ideas, gifts, and music shared between cigar factories, um, ritual spaces, social clubs, churches, Masonic temples, and labor organizing. This movement facilitated the emergence of Afro-Cuban performance in the United States. While African-Americans and Afro-Cubans were initially disparate communities that gradually merge, in New York City, there was already a rich foundation of Caribbean intellectuals and artists at play. When I first began researching the clubs at the Schomburg, I was surprised that I had not heard more about Cosme, a poet in the afro antillian scene who had arrived to New York City much earlier than both singers Celia Cruz and La Lupe and worked on many stages that they would come to be known of working on. After working intimately in the Afro-Cuban and Caribbean performance worlds in New York and Miami for nearly two decades, why hadn't I known about Cosme's career? As I've begun to create a film inspired by my archival reckonings with Cosme and a collaborative artistic project, my collaborators also lamented that they did not know about Cosme beforehand. This historical silence is what anthropologist Michel Rolf Trio urged our generation of ethnographers to rigorously probe by creating historically grounded ethnographies. The silences of Alcos may also point to a need for more public scholarship around Afro-Cuban women's performance histories in the United States. Today, there are new clubs emerging alongside the smaller, less active Club Cubano Interamericano, which continues to struggle under a new generation of leadership. Recently, a huge important cultural institution, which was actually a restaurant with a teeny tiny stage, La Esquina Banera, closed its doors shortly before the pandemic. These businesses are actually cultural relics that have shifted with uh, increased rents, demands on the workday, and costs of raising a family for newly arriving immigrants. They also create interesting political differences and points of contention within the Cuban American exile community that we can investigate through the lens of performance. As I prepare for ethnographic, world, eth ethnographic work in today's dynamics, these poignant historical and archival reminders guide my research questions for the field and for researching um, fellow artists like Pietro Capori, who is uh, an Afro-Cuban born in New Jersey, uh, a dancer, a choreographer, touring with Camille Brown, pictured here. Um, I am also haunted by the silences around great talents like Asubia Cosme, who opened doors for me and our entire generation. Black artists created narratives from their position within an afro antillian diaspora in order to push back against both Cuban and US racial and gendered um, ideologies and their discriminating institutions. By interrogating the intersections of mutual aid, spirituality and politics and Afro-Cuban American experiences, we can better grapple with the social political dilemmas happening in diasporic politics today, which too often result in incendiary fault lines in our current cancel culture and online debates. What might archival spirits teach us about patience, about compassion, about having a conversation of a higher caliber. In this vein, Esobia Cosme is just one of many Afro-Caribbean performers whose memory highlights a legacy of Black sonic and performance traditions that transcend analysis that center the Latin American nation state. Cosme, working class spiritists, and their peers created poetic and musical performances that are not outside of politics, but integral to them. As Sylvia Cosme's repertoire on stage and on the radio in New York City during the 1940s and 50s also reframes the conversations about Afro-Latin erasure from popular film, media, and television today. These ancestral voices speak through the archive as well as through our embodied practices and experiences. It is only up to us to hear them. Thank you. Amazing. Cheers, Jalen. Wow. Very, very inspiring. Very inspiring. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. So we move on with the last presentation of the, of the panel. Um, Pablo Herrera. Pablo, eh, Zoom is yours. Hi, everyone. 
Can you see my slides? You can see my slides. Okay, so basically the, what I will try to do today is I will try to have a presentation of some of these these ideas and see if I if I can go through them. I realized that the, what I wrote and presented for and prepared for today is a little bit longer, but I would try to sort of go through them as quickly as possible. So uh, this is basically my it's a revisit it's basically me revisiting what I presented last year at, at ASA, uh, and then I think I've actually added some more ideas to sort of see if we can. Just uh, it, hopefully this panel will help me think again about you know what's happening here and some ideas. So the beginning is that this is an issue, this is basically an intervention on um, you know issues of how hip hop has dealt with you know coloniality in the, in our hemisphere and particularly my concerns about you know uh, understanding and after a reading of David Scott his idea of you know how anti colonial utopias have uh, gradually withered into post colonial nightmares. Uh, he, it was basically gives us a reference to what was happening in Jamaica, but then in reading him and looking at Cuba, I started co to consider these ideas and how they may be, you know, uh, salient in understanding what was happening with Cuba after uh, the crisis of the special period in the, in the 1990s. And again, I looked at the work of Tanya Saunders specifically to understand also how Cuba was also part of this sort of transnational access of um, uh, a a fight against coloniality in the Caribbean, in the, in the hemisphere. The next thing will be an intervention in, in understanding how hip hop sort of comes together with, um, with this analysis or theorization of, of, Af uh, of, of what happens within hip hop through an Afro, Afro diasporic logic, specifically the work of, 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 of Beliso de Jesus Palmier and Mike Ralph come, be, be, become quite relevant here and how they theorize how to, how to how the rebel spirit of Tupac's as it appeared in a, as a hologram in Coachella a few years ago uh, continues to fight against systemic oppression. And then um, I try to do this in what I will present now. I try to do it as a as, a, as basically as an introduction or a presentation of a black or Afro-Cuban methodology uh, uh, which actually, as, as Catherine McKittrick said, so my, a, a black method is precise, detailed, coded, long and forever. Uh, it's also a, a methodological work of sharing ideas in an unkind work in world. And I found that super, super beautiful for her to say that. Following of that, uh, that I say also that, you know, following McKittrick also, I say that my, my use of a black methodology and method making um, are also academic and extra academic, and they offer rebellious and disobedient and promising ways of undoing discipline. So this is basically, in, the, in a sense, my continuing approach to challenge how to do ethnographic work uh, from an African perspective and, and from a Caribbean perspective, especially as someone whose work was sound so much. So what? So my introduction here then goes to understand how sound itself. And, and, and hearing as a sense, as a human virtue, uh, is understood within the corpus of Ifa literature, right? So when I spoke to a few Baba Laos about it, the first thing that my godfather, as you see here, Joel Lopez Montané said to me, is that the first thing I should think about is how Ori, that, you know, every human, uh, every human being's personal deity uh, or a, a, a human self, is constituted by five percent uh, by five perceptions uh, perception senses, amongst other uh, attributes, and then from there we can start thinking about um, um, uh, uh, as uh, uh, about other senses such as sound. And then he said uh, that that um, you know in, it is the oracular figure of it also Batrupo, which explains the birth of uh, uh, the human sense of hearing. And, and he said, when I w went to the corpus of Ifai and I read the DC Ifa, it says, the Yoruba mythical character named Awo Alara received the sense of hearing from Olorun, the sun. This capacity allowed Awo Alara to favorably work out everything he did because of his ancestors and deities would sometimes speak in his ears. Because he followed their advice, Awo Alara was considered a good son and granted moral wealth. And this this particular paradigm of, like, of being granted more wealth is so, so, something that I kind of aim to address and and want to argue through this presentation. It's like how what happened later uh, uh, or what has been happening since the beginning, 
you could say the beginning of the end, the, you know, the entry of Afro Cubans into or blacks into the space of Cuba. There's been this issue of a historical now listening by the governments, by the power uh, of the island. And, and, and then in here, this is where, and this is something that I had used before with discussing it also with another Babalao. I think that the paradigm or the issue of not listening was symbolic about Okanasode here is the fact that Okanasode explains how and, and, or when was the moment that the human virtue of listening was born in an operative way, right? Um, I think that the main, the main description here is how Okanasode was told to do a specific thing, a, a specific thing, and then he decided not to not to listen. I want to show you the first example of sound of how my, my godfather basically explained what, what happened in Okanasode. This is my first example of sound. Exactamente. Es decir, entró por un oído. Salió por el otro. Por el otro. Lo que hizo la Usted no oye consejo. Ache. So, so here in this, this, this sort of idea that the person does not listen to advice, I kind of, I kind of wanted to play with the symbolism of, of the idea that's behind Okanasot to consider how um, the Cuban state uh, or the Cuban government since colonial times until now has failed to listen to the claims and the demands of Afro-Cubans in terms of social inclusion, in terms of racial equality. Right. And how then this becomes an issue that's portrayed in the music. Um, but what's really interesting here is that when I asked them in terms of, you know, considering the idea of protest, which is kind of the main topic in, in my presentation and, and part of, the, of, of this panel, I, he said, well, I kind of need to think about a particular figure that, that, that tells me about, about, about protest. But I think, and I was kind of amazed by the fact that he mentioned Aponte as someone who I should think about as rather than, rather than an outdo itself, a historical or mythical figure within Afro-Cuban history who basically for the first time, or is basically it's a, the symbol of the beginning of our, of our, of our um, protest uh, for racial, in, racial inclusion. And um, uh, for those who don't know Aponte, Aponte, and I'm reading here a note from Afro-Cuba web, uh, written by Eugene Gottfried in 2006, is that upon, uh, an African man um, of a, a man of African descent, he led struggles in Havana known as the Conspiracy of 1812. Jose Antonio Aponte Ibarra, an autodidact, was uh, loved and cherished by the people of African descent, both those enslaved and those who were free. He belonged to the Cabildo Shango Tedun, which I, I think implies that he was of Yoruba descent himself. He sympathized with the achievements of the Haitian Revolution as a model of the revolution which was successful. Yet, to the contrary of to the country of all the simplistic accusations by the dominant slave owner elite, he never pretended to convert Cuba into a second Haiti. But he was absolutely convinced that his country also needed fundamental changes in favor of the liberation of the oppressed and slave sectors. So the point here that I'm trying to see today is how this issue of the protests. And it's something that's been happening symbolically through history in, in, in the context of Cuba. And then my next example, uh, am I, uh, it's basically, uh, uh, yeah, wait, uh, wait, wait, like, wait, yeah, here. So then, again, going back to Ifa, the Ifa Corpus, I spoke to another Baba, another Baba Lao, Alberto Murdoch, and he said, actually, and this is interesting because I was actually in the middle of preparing the, 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 this presentation, and he said, if you're thinking about protest, you should think about Ofumei. And what it says, it, it, particularly what it, in the sense of what it means to protest. And I was like, well, when I looked in, when I looked at Ofumei and the DC Ifa, it said, through this oracular figure, Ifa seems to symbolically describe what it means to protest. In this figure, 
A5 explains the birth of a person's capacity to defend themselves against attacks. Ofumeyi defines the birth of the human word and the human voice. The cyclopedic treatise also says that those who own it, own, own it meaning who, those who are under the influence of, of this Odu, of Ifa, this, uh, who are under the influence or radiation of this oracular figure, have the power to speak. So my question then would be, could we conclude that Ofumeyi symbolizes the essence of verbal protests? And I think, I, I think that I say this to then start bringing all these other examples of sound and, and particular ex, uh, you know, moments through, through our history where Afro-Cuban leaders, Afro-Cuban men have been discussing this issue of racial inclusion in Cuba and how then this is echoed through the history of Cuban uh, or Afro-Cuban urban music. I think it's really, really interesting. I found, I found a, a very interesting uh, 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 recording of Universidad del Aire where um, at the UCLA archives, um, uh, of a speech by Juan René Betancourt, um, uh, actually in 1959 was the president of the Cuban Federation of Negro Societies. And obviously these Negro Societies are the same kind of societies that Jadel was talking about earlier, right? Uh, but they had the re re representation within Cuba. There's at least six different organizations of this kind, mutual aid societies uh, within, within Cuba. So this is what what the what the never done could said. El ejemplo lo tenemos a la vista. Nadie que analice imparcialmente dudará de la buena fe de Fidel y de su mejor deseo en acabar la disociadora discriminación racial que estorba la consolidación de nuestro pueblo y entorpece el desarrollo económico nacional al privar de poder adquisitivo a una porción considerable de la población. No obstante, a ningún observador honesto se le escapará que el negro ha sido excluido hoy más aún que en ocasiones anteriores de la administración pública. Como el doctor Fidel Castro no puede estar en todas partes, le sucede a él lo que desde que el mundo es mundo le ha sucedido siempre a los hombres de Estado, que sus colaboradores, al no tener exactamente sus mismos sentimientos y sus mismas convicciones, tratan por todos los medios posibles de esquivar, de burlar, y de desobedecer cuantas disposiciones les resulten chocantes o molestas. Y no hay que decir que la cuestión racial, eso de hacerle justicia al negro, de sacarlo de lo propio en que lo tienen sumido, le ha resultado chocante y molesto a muchos, que da la casualidad que tienen poder para no emplearlos, aumentando así el hambre y la miseria en los cubanos de piel oscura. Uh, it's really interesting because this particular uh, uh, a speech of Juan uh, Sotenema uh, Tancur, where he's talking earlier, he says, the oprobio en el que están sumidos, he's basically quoting the national anthem of Cuba. But I think I want to kind of focus on this idea of the more hunger and misery and how this then becomes uh, the reality, you know, that, that we see. I think in a sense, his warning is something that then becomes a reality over time. But... In contrast to, or in contrast, or as a follow-up to what the Nevitan Code is talking about, I want to present to you the beginning, the, 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 another example of this conversation, particularly that of you know how the poetics of, of protest in Cuba began with um, Nicolás Quillén's uh, poem Tango. Tengo, vamos a ver, que siendo un negro, nadie me puede detener a la puerta de un dancing o de un bar o bien en la carpeta de un hotel gritarme que no hay pieza, una mínima pieza y no una pieza colosal, una pequeña pieza donde yo pueda descansar. I think it's what, what I would like to point out here is like the dates when this is happening, right? Like we had one of the Nevertan in 1959, and then five years later, in, you know, in 1964, Guillén writes this poem, and how the, the, this topic of tango or I have becomes uh, or is, is revisited by by rappers then later on uh, my next example is how in in 19 in 2001 after Cuban rap duo hermano se causa revisits uh Guillén's tango and what they say based on what he has said already in 1964 Pasan los años y la situación prosigue intacta El tiempo no perdona Pregúntale a La Habana Que ahorita está en la lona Nadie le importa nada Tengo una raza oscura y discriminada 
Tengo una jornada que me exige y no da nada. nada Tengo tantas cosas que no puedo ni tocarlas Tengo instalaciones que no puedo ni pisarlas Tengo libertad entre un paréntesis de hierro Tengo tantos derechos sin provechos que me encierro Tengo lo que tengo sin tener lo que he tenido Tienes que reflexionar y asimilar el contenido Yeah, so we, we start seeing the recurrence of, of this idea of you know, the state or power, someone's not listening. And this continues to be a theme, right? And, and throughout this conversation of, of specifically coming from the dissectors of the blacks, of blacks in Afro-Cubans and in, 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 Cuba, in, in, in Cuba. Um, my next example is then um, Tango revisited again in in a new or a, a sort of um how do i explain what reparto is so reparto is basically part of the 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 the, the say the, the cultures of rap cubano uh, or or cuban rap or afro-cuban rap but it, it is a it's a rhythmic evolution from the the, the boom bap sound of you know the 2000s and late late 1990s and now this is more of a creolized or creolization de rap Um, to follow up on the the pulse of Cuba, which is more like clave and more dance based, so I think it's really interesting because the theme here is not only a, a, a theme that has to do with tango, but it's also a, a, a addressing uh, the body as well. This is basically dance music, and um, I think it's quite interesting how they they what they say and how tango continues to be a theme. But then how it was, uh, uh, say, uh, connected to what people have today is quite different. <laughs> So, so I think that what's really interesting here, you know, alongside this this reference to materialism, it's um, is that. And obviously that this song is also an address to their peers and their generation of musicians and the people who, who they live with, their community, their, friend, their friends. I, what I find is super interesting here is the conversation with the nation. Uh, it's like this idea of like, you know, we don't need your help anymore because we've been asking. So, you know, this idea that, you know, so far right now, we, we're no longer going to be looking for your, your authority, your To give us what we what we've been ha have been asking you since you know since before 1812, we're just gonna take it. So I think this is really interesting questions about you know citizenship and autonomy. And uh, again, I'm revisiting ideas that I presented last year. But there's how you know like like Devin Benson says how we carved spaces for continued debates about racial equality through the music that we produce and 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 then how the pato you know hood music emerged in Havana's working class neighborhoods five years ago. And it has been criticized as vulgar and 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 a poor Cubans reggaeton. This new urban African rhythm is today's Cuba's most popular dance genre. In this clip, Roberto Duo, Popi La Moa, the Mr. Guillén's famous poem Tango, I have. Uh, Guillén's poem described how in 1964 the revolution or, the, or how 1959's revolution would resolve the late 1800s promise of, of, of Afro-Cubans full inclusion into the project of the nation. Yet by 19, you know, in, 19, in 2019, popular moral response to the poem was that we have to impose our worldview. Revisited it over several generations of Afro-Cuban uh, urban um, African artists, Tengo epitomizes, and I'm repeating this idea again, the poetics of our social protest. And then uh, I think that, I think, it, and I want to, that this is kind of like the, the first part of this presentation, this idea of how the poetics of, of protest have continued 
and evolving and 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 being creolized by through the music and uh, specifically to uh, through the influence of hip hop in Cuba and Cuban music. And I want to sort of bring this sort of this other moment of sublimation of the use of hip hop music. Uh, as, a, as a former protest uh, by the members of the San Isidro movement. This is actually, uh, the reason why this is a, a bit of a, at the beginning of a second uh, a, a, a part of this presentation is because I think there's a lot that's implied in this video that I will show you. And I think there's, you know, there's a lot of different ideas that could be sort of drawn and, 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 and thought about through, through seeing what happens here. But I think that what I, what I what I would do, and this is sort of where I'm coming towards the end of my presentation, is mainly the, the you know um, some of the ideas that I see are, are are coming up, which is actually what I what I what I'll show you after this. But let's just see what you guys make of it, and then I'll tell you what I, some of the ideas that I see happening in the video. Ahí. En la pinga, es patria y vida. Finaliza para que vuelva y vuelva. Finaliza. No, no, no lo va a perder si no va a, a tumbar nada todavía. No me mira su boca, ¿sí? Coño, no, vamos a meterlo aquí. Esto es bocina para afuera, para la pinga. Esto es bocina para afuera. Miren la represión ahí mismo. Right, so, so, yeah, so I think some of the, the part of the themes that I, I try to make it short because I felt that I was going to go too long into discussing my ideas and I kind of have rushed through it uh, to make sure that I don't, I don't incur in, 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 in taking too much time. But um, I think that something that I should read is, again, a part of the theme that I, what I presented today through this example is that the sounds of every, every music have, have taken over Havana's weather. And this was basically an example of how music happens at the street level, right? And, and how, you know, we see people playing the music. This is, I think that what I was talking about before, this idea of the weather, had a sort of a, a perspective, almost like a bird's eye view over Havana. Now we are right directly in the street, seeing how it happens um, uh, within within the households and with, within the houses. And obviously there's definitely some, some ideas like, you know, uh, uh, what what um, Labelle discusses as sidewalk acoustics here. Uh, but um, I think the main issue that, that I would like to, 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 to read is how between 19, between January and July 2018, the government, Cuban government, fined 13, uh, over 13,000 uh, noise promoters uh, on charges of social indiscipline. So this is basically the context in which Patria Vida is played you know, in April of 2021 and how this sonic noise, this new sonic forces, like this is a, a quote from from um, from Tricia Rose, acoustically, uh, acoustically are acoustically illogical and not susceptible to control. Um, Nancy Fraser proposed such sonic forces as subaltern counterpublics in order to signal their nature as parallel discursive arenas where members of subordinate groups invent and circulate counter discourses, which in turn permit them to formulate oppositional in interpretations of their identities, interests, and needs. And again, the, this issue of amplification, especially specifically with, in connection to the, issue, the, the use of technology, and, uh, um, and, um, you know, evokes what, you know, Alexander Waheli has said about, you know, how particular uses of technology um, and allow us to enter, you know, uh, sharing spaces of, of uh, Afro-diasporic citizenship. But I also think that, you know, this, this questions that I'm bringing here and the questions that may be derived from that video uh, 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 you know, about social significance or well, amplify, uh, amplified urban Afro-Cuban music across Havana could also be described through what Julian, what Julian Enrique suggested is social 
cultural wave band. In other words, the bias by which music makes sense and is valued by those who listen to it. I think the, the, the end of this part is this question, you know, and how this question is, is something that I've taken out of Brandon Lavelle's acoustic territory. It's just a question of how this question becomes not, not, not so much to seek of the original sound in pure form, but I think, that, I think this is really powerful to hear it within history, right? Through a, an extended ear as a significant phenomenon of material and shared experience participating in movements of history, right? So I think that this is where I can see this making sense for myself. Uh, uh, as someone who's basically entering and trying to understand what's happening and trying to draw your attention to see if we can, how, how do we discuss these ideas? Uh, my final conclusions here, again, just citing Wehele uh, about, you know, these issues of Afro-diasporic you know, uh, Afro uh, citizenship. Um, is I think, I, th I think the main point that I would like to make how it's how listeners, you know, sh should, should try to consider that we urban Afro-Cuban artists are trans transgressive maroon narrators. Our voices are rhythmical uh, transformations over time that continue to disable Cuba's master narrative of an racial society. In terms of the, in terms of what the, what this presentation or my use or the video was happening in the video might be in conversation with, uh, it kind of makes me think about Bowden's work on rap in Indonesia and how it, how it was used for protesting you know, as well. I think that that's that's some of, of the connection. The other connection could be, and this is sort of more of something that's a bit more recent and, and was happening with was happening with several. Um, Cuban and Latin American scholars who've dis described, uh, um, uh, you know, the San Isidro movement and what they do as a as an Afro-Cuban uh, struggle or as part of the Afro-Cuban struggle, uh, which I think is kind of problematic. What I was actually reading here is understanding the recent sounds of protest in this way, and this is what she writes: We can think of them as reconstructing Floyd's extinguished voice and amplifying his solidarity protest against restraint, allowing it to extend the many other ways in which racial injustice weighs on the necks of black people around the world. I say that possibly because I, I mean, because I, because being Cuban, being from Havana myself, I wonder how could San Isidro movement protest events like the one we saw in the video and San, and the San Isidro movement overall be truly associated with black Afro-Cuban protests if following Cuban domestic colorism logics, their members are not considered black by Cuban standards. And, and the members themselves are not pronounced themselves as representative of an Afro-Cuban struggle. So I think that what I'm trying to do here with bringing this question here of the work from, um, from, from Scott is this idea that I'm not, I kind of wonder to, to what extent they have to say that they're doing black struggle or that they're, they're actually in, engaging in, in a black or African protest for them to be considered as such. Um, the other questions that I have is how do issues of gender cut through or intersect these ideas that I have presented here? And I think that this will be something that I would like to discuss. I think there's a lot of male voices uh, that are being, you know, have actually considered in use in this, in this presentation. And then the other one is sort of a bit more, a sort of broader sort of idea is sort of to see if, in what ways my use of your five regular figures to situate my epistemological analysis, help you know reevaluate ethnographic narratives in Black and Caribbean studies. This is something that we will we'll have to see. But um, that that that's basically my presentation today. Thank you so much. Okay, fantastic, cheers, Paolo. Wow, muchas gracias. Very lots of lots of stuff there to go through. Okay, so um, we I calculate that we can go a little bit into the break. And I figure we can have like a 20 minute uh, Q&A uh, session here, maximum 20 minutes. So that this, and then this would give us five minute breaks to stretch and also to transition to the other Zoom account, which is where the, the second panel is gonna be. All right, cool. So it's a pleasure to invite our discussant, Jim, Jim Sykes. Um, Jim, what's, you, what's your take on, these, on this first panel? All right, thank you everybody. Um, just to make sure I'm a little clear on the format here. So you guys asked me to write like a seven, eight minute uh, response. So I do actually have a formal 
response, but it engages both panels together. So I have things I could say now, but I, to be honest with you, I'm a little bit worried I'm going to sort of repeat myself for what I'm presenting later. Um, so uh, with that caveat in mind, maybe I'll just say a couple things that come to mind to open up discussion, but um, please be aware that I'll actually elaborate these points in a little bit more detail later. So thanks for that. Um, so the first thing that came to mind is, you know, I'm really struck by the theme of acoustomology, which is obviously, you know, the classic concept and it's it's central to, you know, it's in the title of the panel. And um, all these papers engaged acoustomology in some way, though not everybody talked about it. Um, so obviously Feld's uh, famous term, you know, is about uh, acoustomology meaning a sonic way of knowing. And he really thought about sound in a, in a spatialized sense. So the classic sense in his writings of walking through a rainforest and sort of orienting yourself through sound. And of course, acoustomology then has actually been used in other ways, um, you know, more epistemologically and so forth, finding your way through sound. So um, that much is obvious, but what really strikes me here is in thinking about sound as transgression, we're also dealing with a real spatialization of power that I think is often visualized, right? So this really came up in Monique's talk in particular, where she had a chart that showed the sort of working class that way, and power that way, and there's this sort of middle and they're kind of clashing. And so I'm gonna talk about this more in my formal uh, response after the second panel, but it brought up the inevitably the idea of a dialectic and uh, the sort of dialectics that constitute modernity. Um, again, don't wanna give away my, my later talk. But, um, so, but what this means is I'm wondering about this link between acoustomology as sound and its role in transgression on the one hand and the visualization of social relations and the role of culture in that on the other, because um, I think to say that the visualization of power has colonial baggage with it is not going far enough because it literally is the colonial and colonial baggage, right? And so um, the spatialization of this power came out in a number of the talks here. So like uh, public versus private, market versus culture, upper class, working class, masculine, feminine, and the British colonial noise abatement acts that Sonia talked about um, resonates a lot with um, what I've studied in South and Southeast Asia, specifically the colony of Ceylon, where the British also had uh, procession permits. Uh, they prohibited certain kind of festivities in public space. Um, this is very much related to liberalism uh, as a sort of political, uh, sort of legal philosophy. And so I think um, what I'm wondering is um, how to sort of move beyond this, because on the one hand, the sort of spatialization of the dialectic is actually there and is something people are dealing with. And so it's not so easy to get rid of. It actually produces culture itself. Um, on the other hand, I think if we fail to move beyond that spatialization, then uh, the role of sound as transgression, um, you know, is maybe not doing its job. Or maybe to rephrase that, like, what is the role of sound in challenging the spatialization? Does it have any sort of role? What do we do with that? And so this actually opens up to the question of different sorts of ontologies, which really came out in the last two talks. So from Jadel and Pablo, um, the sort of spirituality, other worlds question, different ways of understanding the human. I particularly like Jadel's phrase, archival spirits can teach us about patience. Um, Pablo talking about how sound takes over Havana's weather. Um, so, you know, I have more that I'll say about this when we get to the politics of his exhaustion, which come in with MBQ's talk. But maybe for the moment, I'll just open up the floor and ask if anybody wants to address this question between the sort of spatialization of power, the kind of visual maps that we have for uh, conceptualizing power, and this relation of sound uh, which is inherently, we tend to not spatialize it, but now through sound studies, we kind of are. How do you understand the relations between these? And what is the role of sound in sort of either challenging this visualization, or are we sort of stuck with the visualization because that's creating the framework for sonic action, if that makes sense? Mm. I'll open the floor up. Of course, it's possible that my question was just a little bit too much. Too much no, no, we're, once, we're processing. Give us a second. <laughs> hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. I, I mean, my first, if I mean, I wasn't one of the presenters and the question is not addressed to me, but something that I kept coming back to in my, in my notes is, um, is that in all of these stories that I heard today, the, the, there's a very clear sight the, the public space and uh, 
so the recurrent thread here is that is me regarding this specialization thing is that that the importance of public spaces in in, in, in transgressive practices right so that's so the all these all these works are occurring in a, in a, in, in a site in a, in a location and they are a struggle for to be heard in in, in, in public spaces um, another specialization that I appreciate in all these papers is that these transgressives, these individuals or these transgressive acts, they are networked across different spaces. They're not located in a particular location. And I'm wondering whether that's another ingredient. I, I'm, what I'm struggling with is what are the, what is, what are the terms of the transgressive event? Like I'm, I'm still wondering of the usefulness of that. And mm. How does that help think? So I'm looking for characteristics of transgression. So I have this public space business, and then I have the idea of transgressions are, are networks. We can call it migration, we can call it cosmopolitan ambitions, but they are but they are networks. Yeah, that's what comes to mind when I hear you talk about space and, and the epistemology. Uh, could I, Jim, could I, could I, so, so um, Carlo, could I just say something briefly? Yeah, so um, it, I, I think that what I what I was trying to do is something that I've discussed before in other works and other presentations. I think I, I was trying to bring it and make it a, a, a real clear example of how what I've discussed before as a black territory happens. Um, and I think I think that this idea of the black territory and how it's carved against against the other space of of, of the city of Havana in particular. It's, uh, it's it, it has to do with particular you know the ways in which music itself you know in this case hip hop uh, be, be, becomes a form of ideology right or works as a certain ideology that's basically contesting state ideology in particular in, in the case of Afro Cubans um, there's this I don't know if you guys are familiar with this term of the new men the new the new women in particular behaviors that are basically expected from from the, from the citizens of Cuba. That basically they are breaking by acting in this other way by blasting this other music. That uh, following the idea that that Bowden talks about, uh, it's become specifically their their the biggest concern about hip hop in Cuba was that it will be something that will be disruptive of Cuban reality. So this these transnational ideologies that are basically transferred over you know over 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 you know, over music become then then used within the context of Cuba as a way to contest the the the, the you know, supposed normal normalcy or normality that is supposed to be integrated into the into the subjectivities of Afro Cubans as they are part of, of of the Cuban society. But I think in particular the issue here is that this is how I and I visualize it how this particular household and him standing at the door and I in a kind of quasi performance of a sidewalk a sidewalk about acoustics that Lavelle talks about is the beginning of this idea of this black territory of this palenque sonoro of this uh, um uh, uh, um, yeah, and, uh, the sonic emplacements that, that Bohan talks about as well. It's like how this music is becoming, is taking over, and then you can see down the block, you know, all the neighbors looking at what's happening, and then the other side you have the police seeing how these two things are taking place, right? Uh, obviously, this is particularly symbolic because uh, Movimiento San Isidro is, um, is, has, has got a lot of notoriety, but it doesn't mean that down the street another neighbor may, may be just playing reggaeton at the same time that that's happening without really getting that much attention from the public um, and also the police. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of, I think what I wanted to position is like how power here is, con is con contested by playing the sound that has a particular um, issue that... Uh, uh, with what I'm trying to say is, is that this this music as a genre is something that the Cuban state was actually quite worried about, and then the second part of it is also that the lyrics and so much just are a challenge to what Fidel Castro called patria muerte at some point, and then now become patria y vida. Um, so it's a complete complete challenge to uh, Cuban socialist um, ideology. Mm -hmm. Great. Anyone else want to jump in at that point? How much time do we have, by the way, guys? I don't, I don't know how much time you're giving us. Oh, you're muted, Carlos. Sorry. 
we can have around 10 more minutes. Oh, okay. All right. 10 minutes, yeah. Um, I'll see if, you know, I, there's so much I want to say to MBQ. Sorry, Michael, I keep, I'm used to calling you MBQ. MBQ's talk who's in my response, but I'm going to save that till till later. Um, you know, Pablo, I don't know if this uh, is completely, it's sort of riffing on you, but going in a slightly different direction. I mean, I think one of the value of sound studies versus a music studies approach is that it moves beyond the sort of discourse of representation that is really inherent in traditional ways of thinking about music. And, and that the traditional way of thinking about music as sort of genre, as representation of identity and so forth, that of course plays an important role in transgression and protest also, as came out in some of these talks, for instance, the talk about grime, right? So it is possible to sort of think through that framework, but that really to me is different from what some of the other talks are doing. And I guess Pablo, since you spoke last, that's sort of in my mind now, which again has more to do with the sort of spatialization of sound. So I think, um, you know, to kind of come back to my ontology question, you know, is sort of rethinking not just sort of human relations with sound, but also the spatialization of power in relation to how we conceptualize music history, that it's not just about the sort of representation of identity, it's also something that's spatialized, that's acting against power that way. And, you know, I don't necessarily have a question here, I'm just sort of riffing on it because it, it, it uh, strikes me as two different ways of thinking about how sound and music can be transgressive and can produce protest. And I'm not sure I've, I've quite wrapped my head around it too much yet. What I've done in some of my earlier work uh, in thinking about Sri Lanka is to actually use this sort of uh, budding discussion of, of ontological difference or alterity to think what would the representation of musical genres in a narrative of cultural history do if we actually took ontological difference and these different ways of thinking about sound, such as spatialization, and actually put them into these narratives of cultural history, that would that be a sort of way of flipping the script, so to speak? So um, without dwelling on it um, too much, uh, in, in my book, for instance, uh, I thought about music as a gift, which was related to Sinhala Buddhist ways of using music in Sri Lanka. And a gift, of course, is about exchange. And so to think about the gift on the level of the nation sort of thinks about music, not so much about a singular identity, but about relations. So that's just sort of one example. But um, so that, that's a lot to, to digest there. I'm just sort of riffing, but I see that Michael's got his hand up. So let's go with him. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, everybody. I just wanted to ask a question. Um, that, I mean, it seems to me, uh, Jim, in, in, in when you're talking about spatialization, it seems to me that so many of the talks also deal with a particular kind of way of dealing with memory. And so, you know, Jadel and Pablo's talks, um, you know, in particular, for me, they they sort of deal with, I guess, you know, the ontological difference of Ocha and, and Ifa and so on, but also with, um, you know, Ifa as a kind of way of encoding memory, right? A kind of particular way of encoding and accessing history or in Jadel's uh, talk, the, you know, access to direct access in that case to, to the ancestors. And I was just struck by like across all four of the talks, there's really a constant kind of hearkening back, whether it's to, you know, Windrush era ancestors who have sound systems, um, in the, the, the ground talk or the idea of the sound system itself as the national instrument. And I think that um, Dr. Stanley now calls it uh, the drum at, at, at one point. So I just wanted to ask about, um, you know, how you are thinking about, um, thinking about history and thinking about memory. I mean, it's not really at the front of what I'm gonna be talking about, but I think that in some ways there are, there, there's ways in which a particular kind of affect um, a particular sort of feeling um, is recycled and brought into the, the present moment from, uh, you know, historical pasts. And that sound sort of does that in particular sorts of ways. So I, I wanted to ask you folks, I was really so struck by, um, by the way that you did that. Mm. Mm. So to make that a specific question, how, how do you, how do you, how do you imagine historicity, how do you imagine the past in, in what you're talking about? Um, yeah, that, you... um, great questions. So much to think about. I'm just trying to scribble away because I'm going to need all of this very soon for my dissertation proposal. <laughs> but um, 
historicity memory i mean i think part of what i'm trying to say is um i'm trying to trouble the idea of the nation and geography obviously and part of i think what i'm arguing is that um first and foremost yeah we have to have a gender and racial analysis of protest uh, social activism uh, performance and I also want to push back on these ideas of the spiritual, uh, spiritual labor and labor, like, again, cigar factory workers and um, the politics, diaspora politics, uh, protesting state violence, all of the, the, the different forms and iterations that we commonly hear. Uh, for example, here in the States, we have Black Lives Matter, right? But we're, we don't necessarily have these deeper kind of more nuanced diasporic conversations with it. Like that's one critique we could, we, could, we could rightfully launch with BLM and its discourse. And related then is like, when we look at the histories of protests, like so many of the other presentations um, got at, I think that we can start to map different genealogies. And so part of what I'm trying to do is push Cosme to the front, not in a delusional way, but in a way where she was friends with Romola Lachatanyane, Nicolas Guillen, who Pablo mentioned. She's, I think you could say she's a predecessor to Cuban hip hop in certain ways, her mm -hmm. poetics. Her, I, mean, I, I didn't really delve into her body of performance work. Um, but I mean, rhyme, time, meter, again, these things are not particular to a genre. And so again, resonating with what Jim is saying about sound as opposed to music studies, I think we're making a really nice, nice interventions. But social memory for me, I guess when, when we start to then place a gender and a racial analysis at the forefront and we start to break down, right, the idea of nation and what it is or what it does or what it doesn't do in the case of because it erases right all of these migrants who leave and again I couldn't map in my presentation but you have really complicated things where you have my a grandmother and this is Caribbean stuff too but you might have a grandmother who's in Key West and someone else in New York and someone else in Santiago and so th when we start to really map these geographies when we start to look and center people like Cosme what we see is something more sophisticated than th what we've told I think mm. and it's specifically in terms of memory so I don't for me what I'm grappling with is like what is the difference between the club, you know, taking minutes, right, and doing all their meetings in Spanish in the United States, whether in Tampa or New York, to make a vote uh, against, uh, will we uh, be on this float or will we vote against this tax ordinance, right? And the, the intimate sacred space of a Misa, which again, so many anthropologists have tend to describe in terms of just protocols or in terms of kind of, narrow understanding of belief. I want to understand, similar to Pablo, how spirituality is a vehicle for memory, for history, for politics, but also like the connection. Like, I don't think we can have a club without those misas. Hmm. You know? I, I don't think that we can have a Movimiento San Isidro without a Cosme, you know? And so we could talk about other women in hip hop, and other, but that also would be boring. And that would also be reductive to the ways that we, you know, are productive to think about diasporic politics, right? So, I mean, Coco Fusco's work comes to mind too. And this is then again, a part of a longer history of New York and Tampa and Key West. We see it over and over and over in the Movimiento San Isidro. We think of Luis Manuel Otero Alcantara as Habanero, as maybe, yes, Mulato creating this song, but the song was recorded in Miami. And then Michael, to, to, they put the, their lyrics on in Cuba. That's really fascinating stuff. Like that's the technology that the previous generations didn't have. And so I think it can open up, um, we really take the task of memory and politics uh, from this kind you know, of what I, what, analysis. Come, yeah, what, I think more, more things, we can find more things in the present. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think what's what's coming to mind here is is the other side of of, of acoustemology. So Michael was asking about affects. What is the affect? Yes, and um, and acoustemology is not. <laughs> please, I'm brainstorming. It's not just uh, you know thinking in, in sound, but it's also thinking with sound. 
And I'm also wondering, uh, you know, you, you, you approach a biography of, a, of an individual, of an artist, through sound, through the music that they, and then so that, what, the, the, what is the story? So the story that I hear from Jadon and Pablo is what, what are the stories that emerge from when we approach this issue from the perspective of music or sound? And I think that speaks to the other side of, of epistemology. Um, we should have a 10 minute break for the sake of stretching and someone go to the toilet and stuff. So um, a, I suggest we have to close this Zoom and go to another one. Let me put the link here. Um, um, that thing, go there, and then and then click on Zoom, and it's, it's another account. We, and, and we resume the second panel there. And Michael, we we'll start with you in the second in the second panel. All right. So yeah, cheers around for the first panel. Cheers, Sonia. Hope to see you around in the second in the second panel in, in ten okay. minutes. Okay. All right. See see you guys in a bit. Bye bye.